so I can actually match them to existing forest cover, stuff like that. And uh, <coughs> my one hypothesis that I didn't set out to test in this NSF project, uh, but which I'm going to test if I can get my hands on these data today. Um, so for today, I want to talk about spatial prediction. I'm going to try and get that um, social media mapping stuff up. I can't get Blackboard to agree with Java and some of this JavaScript. Not stuff that you would have to see, but stuff I put up there to make it work. I'm still trying to clutch that around. Yeah, you know, I don't know, but I'm going to I'm going to get something up there so you can see how this would work. Um, did you check out that website though? The public, you know, public information. So check this out. Let's spend a minute doing that real quick. Um, and, and while you're while we're doing this, you can log into Blackboard and get the uh, the data, which is in the week 15 folder that we'll be messing with. Um, so the links in the syllabus. But I think if you if you search for public information map, I think you'll get it. And in this one, it's telling you about um, yeah, it's telling you about hurricanes, the one that I found. But if we check this out, you can actually turn on and off certain layers. And so I'm going to go over here to layers and turn off active hurricanes and evacuation centers and YouTube. And uh, let's turn on Twitter. And you have to sign in in this case. So I'll sign in with my Twitter handle. But you could do um, Instagram, too, if you wanted. So turn these off. Turn on Twitter. And as you may be aware, when you use social media, um, you can, let's see, you can geotag your locations, right? Have any of you ever done this? Turn it off as soon as possible. Yeah. It's usually a good idea unless you really want people to know where you are because otherwise, you know, oh, you're sitting in your living room and you tweet out like, you know, I don't know, whatever, you know, watching Game of Thrones and I'm really annoyed about this, right? And, and you know, people know that where you live, or you know, I mean, I'm sure that if you went searching online, you find all kinds of stories about how divorce has resulted in social media posts with location tags, about how people have been fired over social media posts with location tags because of the location information. Um, so you know, you got to be careful. This isn't giving you everything, but it is giving you those public tweets in this case, which are located. You know, do have location tagged onto them. And, uh, you know, maybe you want to search for a search term. You can actually enter that in here. And this doesn't require you to use GIS. Now, you could go uh, more complicated here and actually connect to Twitter's application programming interface and pull down tweets and map them in real time if that's what you want. Right? So this is possible to do. It takes a little bit of ingenuity, but you can do it. And what they've done here on Esri's public information map is just make it available to everybody. So what's a, what's a hashtag or a, a search term that you would want to enter on Twitter that's at least no worse than PG rated? Think of anything? Tonight Show. Okay. Let's see what we get. Um, probably not too much in Madagascar. But if we zoom in, let's zoom in on our neck of the woods and see what we get. Let's make sure that it's there. Okay, we got some tweets, right? Here's one uh, east, uh, in <coughs> Clay County. Let's see what we got here. Apparently there was some country music awards show tonight that I somehow missed. So why is that there? Show and tonight are in the tweet, right? It uh, doesn't look like anybody in Vigo County was publicly tweeting about The Tonight Show or shows tonight, but around Metro Indy, there were plenty um, here. Good show tonight. Doesn't look like it's The Tonight Show. Uh, 
drag show fundraiser for Starbucks Pride. So, show and tonight, okay? Uh, let's see, out here in uh, Hancock County, I almost forgot, Authors Band is playing the TCM show tonight, show tonight. So, you gotta be careful about your, um, your operators. We can change this to just tonight's show by encasing it in quotes. And uh, probably have to go to like New York City to find anybody tweeting about it. Okay, one person in Indiana. Apparently Deb Mann appears to be a res registered nurse maybe. So sad I was unable to make Joe's show tonight. Not even, okay, here's tonight's show. Saw him five times live on the tonight show. Okay, so, you know, this is interesting. What, why do you think this is on a public information map, which includes things like radar and NOAA warnings and active hurricane? Why would you include the ability to connect to Twitter? Oh crap, the storm surge is flooding my house. Hashtag gotta get out. Right? I, I'm kind of joking, but not too much. Um, it turns out that not, maybe not publicly available, but if you had a Twitter you know, God mode API access, essentially you can look at everything. Twitter uh, tweets tend to be a pretty good indication of what's going on where. And so public information, especially emergency managers, but public information managers do use Twitter to track things, including severe weather, uh, natural and, and human disasters uh, pretty extensively. Right? Because nobody does this anymore, but you can actually tweet with a dumb phone. You know, one that just texts. Anybody ever do that in this room? Uh, <coughs> so, so, you know, even when, say, network connectivity is not available for your phone, you might be able to send a text message. And so people do use this kind of information to make decisions or to aid in rescue efforts, stuff like that, right? Anyway, um, <clears throat> I thought I'd point that out. Now, if you want to get on the technical side of things, um, you can actually look at the, a the application programming interfaces or APIs of these services. So, you know, this is the Twitter platform uh, API. It allows you to post or pull information from Twitter using basically programming languages, right? And you can do that in a lot of different contexts. I figured I'd, I'd point that out to you. But for today, that's not what we're gonna look at. Um, instead, we're gonna look at uh, Spatial prediction, and specifically two methods of spatial prediction. So let me get my uh, zip file here. Do all of you have that downloaded? It'll save you time if you download the data and, and open it. So you want to download them and extract them. Um, while you're doing that, I would like to just update you on a couple schedule things while I'm, now that I just thought about it. Um, first question uh, Nicole had, do we have homework due tonight? No. No homework due tonight. Okay. Uh, last week there's, uh, you know, there's the material from last week. No. Well, Wednesday is at 5 p.m. deadline for all of the assignments. Okay, so you've submitted everything so far. Um, I today and tomorrow we have job candidate on campus, and then Wednesday I'm at a con Wednesday through Saturday I'm at a conference. I should have grading completely up to date by the end of Friday. So going into study week, which is next week, you should have a pretty clear idea of where you stand in the class and what's going on, okay? Um, there will be an assignment for this week, focusing on creating. I haven't put the, the submission up, but to give you an overview, we're gonna do two different types of spatial prediction modeling using a data set that we've looked at before in class, right? 
Um, these data are are Terre Haute led data, so we're going to do familiar. Um, and we're going to use we're going to look at two different ways of predicting lead concentrations at, at intermediate locations where we don't have sample points. And those two outputs are going to look really different from one another. Okay. What you'll do for this assignment is make a difference image of those two. I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. And then upload a zipped copy of that image. That's your, assign that's your submission for the assignment. On. Basically, it, need, it will look pretty much like it's one way if it's right and not if it's not. All right. Um, and I'm trying to think. And then next weekend, or next week, we're going to be doing spatial regression and, uh, I'm sorry, Wednesday it will be spatial autocorrelation analysis, and then next week it will be spatial regression modeling. Right. Now you might be a little worried because you might not have taken statistics recently. We'll get into that a little bit. Basically teach you how to interpret the outputs of a spatial regression, what it can do and can't do, and you know, kind of leave the foundational why does regression work for a stats class that you will take in the future or have already taken, okay? In other words, you shouldn't freak out about the word regression. Questions about this? So we don't meet Wednesday, but we meet Monday, Wednesday, next week, and you're gonna try to upload the week 14 assignment? Because I'm not gonna have that same look. You won't do, yeah, for, for last week, The one for this this week that's due next week you'll have. And then next week I don't believe there's an assignment listed, right? Yeah. There's no assignment for next week. So this is the last assignment, this one today. Yeah. Well, except for the paper in the case of grad students and the practical final exam for undergrads. So undergrads, the practical final final exam is going to be here's a data set, give me these things. Right, and they're, it's going to involve thinking critically about what you're doing. It's going to be stuff we've been exposed to, but could include things like reprojecting your data set, right, to calculate, for example, accurate area measurements or accurate distance measurements. So if I were to provide you with a data set in geographic projection coordinate system, that would be unacceptable for calculating the area of a polygon, right? Why? Everybody's like, oh crap, it would be unacceptable. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, so Earth is round. A projection is taking around Earth and making it flat. So, like how, how, how that map is wide in Indiana, that's because it was flat. Yeah, it's flattened but not projected. Projected as in curve. So, yeah, the term projection is kind of irritating. Yeah. Let me see. What's the, I think, let's do this. So, the word, the term projection is, is irritating, in my opinion. And that's because uh, we don't project anymore, right? We just use mathematical models to do it. But it used to be that if we were mapping something, Right, so you can, can you see that horizontal line from the projector on there? If we were mapping something, and we wanted to, say, preserve something like area measurements, we couldn't use a globe because we need a flat map. We would do something like this. We'd take a shape. Who knows what shape? Right? Maybe it would, it's supposed to be a globe. But maybe we figured out mathematically speaking that a cone at high latitudes okay, gives you less distortion. So we would literally project the map onto this surface, right? So you see the line there? And we would, if we do this, I mean, we take that, that line, we find it again. There. We would take this line, let's say, and we would trace it on that shape. Now, that's terrible. Then when you lay it out, that straight line is no longer straight, right? It's curved. 
And so you pick a shape based on what you want to preserve. A conic projections tend to preserve area along certain lines of contact with this globe. Uh, cylinders, something else, usually uh, distance end area to some degree, or other shapes as well. So that's what a projection is. You're actually, it's a mathematical adjustment to bend the ground shape into some other shape to minimize distortion of some kind. You can have area distortion, distance distortion, or angular distortion. In other words, north isn't north, right? And we usually look to, we think about what we're going to use our data for, and then if a projection is adequate for the purpose that we're going to use. So if I were to ask for an area measurement, you want to make sure your data could accommodate area somewhat accurately. So if you look at, say, this poster here, map projections, if you search USGS map projections poster, you do the exact same thing, the website version. But it's pretty useful. You can also get like a 600 page report on when to use what map projection where. Right? But this gives you some of the some of the basics about what you would use it for. So one that we use a lot is the universal transverse mercator projection that's good for distance and area and narrow bands right around the earth. Um, in this one, let's see, we have transverse mercator. It says used by USGS for many quadrangle maps that scales from one to twenty four to one to two hundred fifty one to twenty four thousand to one to a quarter million. Uh, such maps can be joined at their edges only if they're in the same zone. It's a narrow north-south division. Uh, let's see. Also used for mapping large areas that are mainly north-south in extent. Distances are true only along the central meridian selected by the map maker or else along lines parallel to it. In other words, distances are really only accurate north-south, straight up and down. Or if you spin that transverse mercator, you can make the line of of correct distance wherever you want it to be. So you see this gets pretty complicated. Uh, let's see what else it say. All distances, directions, shapes, and areas are reasonable, eight, reasonably accurate within 15 degrees of the central meridian. Distortions of distances, distances, directions, and size of areas increases rapidly outside the 15 degree band. So universal transverse mercator, we have all these zones and they have a middle place and then how wide do you think the zones are? 15 degrees of longitude this way. I think actually to minimize distortion entirely, we do this. It's like 7.5 degrees, 7.5 degrees, basically each direction. So the whole zone is only 15 degrees wide. Make sense? In other words, we know that areas, distances, and directions do not de distort significantly within 15 degrees of the center meridian. So you half that distance and you get your 15 degree zone of high accuracy. And that gives us the universal transverse mercator projection system, which had lots of different zones. And so hint, hint, that would be a good projection to select if I'm asking for area or distance measurements because it's going to do a good job of both. Right? As long as I'm not mapping an area wider than 15 degrees. Anyway, uh, to, to make a long story short, you got to choose an appropriate projection according to what you're going to measure, not just in how things look. Because sometimes the measurement might be accurate, but the map looks like crap. Right? The, the, there are area distortions in shape, but the area measurement might be accurate. Hard to imagine a projection where that would be so, but you could probably really mess with one to make it yourself. Right. You have a question? Uh, and so you'll have to do some basic level GIS analysis like that, right? Uh, Reproject or you know create a ratio variable or something like that. Um, but it's really going to be making sure you can calculate a couple things, do some stuff in multiple. Areas of GIS. I won't be doing a network analysis question because, or, or components of that, because network analysis requires a pretty specific data type and data setup. And integrating that with the other things I'd like to make sure you know how to do is just not going to be practical in a practical example. But 
But so things to just make sure you know how to do. You should know how to deal with basic raster data, vector data, and some attribute table operations and add a new field, calculate new va value for that field. Okay. And you should be able to consider, well, is this a question I need to reproject my data for or not? You know, is this a question where uh, I might have to adjust the display or I might have to adjust my calculation to exclude missing data? Those sorts of questions might come into play. So if you go slowly and think carefully about what I'm asking you to do, you should be absolutely fine. And it's open book, too, so it's not like you have to sit down and do it, right? Uh, you, you can use the internet, you can Google away, you can look at integrity videos, whatever it is that you need to. <coughs> All right? Yeah. Uh, you, you what? I'm just looking at the data. Okay, yeah, so let's look at the data. <coughs> there are final sample data, uh, sample point data with attributes. Let's, uh, let's look at the attribute table. That's where you're finding that, right? So here's our attribute table. We have a whole bunch of sample information. Uh, we have our east, easting and northing values, which are just UTM coordinate locations. And then we have a bunch of distance to variables. Some population variables, some racial variables some housing unit variables and pro, uh, proportion of, let's see, yeah, proportion minority, proportion vacant, et cetera, right? Uh, the variable that we're going to be interested in for this assignment is actually the PB underscore final variable. So as you know from the periodic table of the elements, PB is lead, right? And what we have here is our lead concentrations in parts per million from soil lead samples. So you know, what does that mean? Well, the data were collected by taking the first inch of topsoil off of all, at all of these locations and analyzing them two ways. First is a hand, handheld XRF, which just uses x-rays to excite subatomic particles measures the response of the subatomic particles which are unique to the element composition of the sample. Uh, it gives a good indication of how much lead is in or how much of uh, about a third of the periodic table is in a sample in about a 90 second exposure to these x-rays. Uh, it's, it's not bench grade accurate but in, with some um, elements it gets pretty darn close. The other way these data were collected was with an ICP in the room immediately next to this one, where the data were crushed, sieved, I believe uh, ashed, I mean cooked, so the organic material is gone, and then run through the ICP, so, and that is a bench grade, lab grade instrument. And uh, except at the extreme ends of the range, the XRF actually does a pretty good job of figuring out how much lead is in, <coughs> is in a sample. So uh, these are the final measurements. Uh, the extremely high and extreme, the extremely high ones are verified with ICP, right? So they're, they use a bench grade instrument. In some cases, the XRF was pretty good at overestimating lead, I think, um, when it was extreme. You know, like, hmm, maybe we should set up a lead mine in this neighborhood, <laughs> right? Or did, did we crush up a bullet <laughs> <laughs> and, and figure out how much lead was in there. So, so, you know, you can look just by sorting this. Some places had no observable lead, zero parts per million lead. Uh, and some had incredible amounts of lead, like 33,320 parts per million, right? Uh, EPA action levels are you got to do something when you have over 400 parts per million. So 33,000 is lots of parts, lots of parts per million too many. Anybody know why you care about lead? What are some of the reasons? Yeah, can, lead toxicity is not something you want to experience. It causes nervous system problems, long-term issues too, uh, even organ failure. What else? Makes your kids dumb. 
right? Uh, if they eat lead chips or lead dirt bullets, they, it's not good for their mental development. What else? Are there any other at-risk folks from too much lead exposure? Yeah, I think it can exacerbate your sensitivity to other exposures too. I don't really know too much about that. Uh, two other things that I'll point out that I do know about. One, uh, lead in high level, at high levels of exposure will actually replace bone density. Right, so you, yeah, your, bone, your body will stick lead in your bones essentially, which isn't so much a problem when you're a healthy young person, but as an adult and especially as a female, uh, older adult, Osteoporosis can be exacerbated by that problem. Probably the same level of effect as drinking lots of carbonated beverages, right? And it also has a bone density effect. It's not going to cause you to have osteoporosis, but can exacerbate the problem, right? Uh, that would be, I think, the effect. And then the other one is a social effect in that high lead concentrations correlate with violent crime. So, you know, you got to ask, did it cause? hard to say, but we do know um, from a multi-decadal studies now that, you know, when you remove lead from, as a gasoline additive, violent crime decreases. Uh, cities with lower lead burden have less violent crime problem. Is it that there's greater investment in social services in cities with lower lead densities, uh, lead exposure ratings probably, but hard to say, right? It could just be an indic indicator of something else going on. Or lead makes you a violent homicide or maniac. I don't know. Uh, anyway, so so the cool thing about these data are that there are a lot of them, right? Um, this is actually data produced by um, Dr. Latimer and uh, Heather Fox, a master's student from our program who graduated pretty recently, works for the DNR now. Uh, is she at DNR or DEQ? Yeah, IDEM. IDEM, okay, yeah. DEQ, environmental management folks in the water area. She, she's moved a little bit within IDEM, but, um, and she did this because she was interested in, in soil lead contamination, especially because, you know, if you have it in certain locations, it's going to pose greater risk, like if you have it in neighborhoods where lots of kids live, for example. Um, and Vigo County has some of the highest blood lead levels in children in the state, and by extension, the country, because Indiana doesn't fare very well in those sorts of metrics, generally. We have a lot of lead exposure pathways, including burning lots of coal and uh, being a transportation corridor, right? Um, we have a lot of latent lead. A and with an aging housing stock, we have a lot of lead in, in our s environmental system. Um, and Heather wrote a master's thesis on this. So, so there are over 1,000 points. And you, know, you can kind of see, just mapping out points if you want, some of these, if we switch to quantities, uh, or, yeah, quantities in a proportional symbol map. When we pick our lead values, you can kind of see where the le big lead is. Maybe we go to graduated symbols instead. You can see where the higher concentrations of lead tend to be, and, and where do you see them? In the core downtown area and the older housing developments, both north and south of town. Farrington's Grove, areas down by I-70, and areas north of campus uh, a little ways, right, up toward Union Hospital. But this kind of display isn't very helpful. It's not very helpful for a couple of reasons. One, um, you know, you can have a high lead concentration sitting on top of a low lead concentration, like we have here. It kind of looks like a bullseye. You got a little dot on top of a big dot, right? Um, it's also not very useful like if you were to color code these, it would end up being kind of a mess of different colors. Uh, and then, you know, we have all these this data, but what if your house is right here? I mean, if you think you're safe, well, it would appear that way, but what is safe? I mean, these little dots, look at the range of these little dots in my map on the screen here. Zero parts per million to 453 parts per million. Well, if you're at 453 parts per million, you might need to remediate. 
if you want your kids to play on the play set in the backyard, right? So there are other ways that we can kind of interpolate this. And you could use interpolation where you're guessing, making an informed guess of an intermediate value of a location where you have not made a sample. And that's useful. Use IDW or spline um, to make an interpolation of that center point. So, or, or that intermediate location. So one strategy would be to interpolate. What are some problems with interpolation? So if you think of it in profile, right, uh, interpolation, you might have two points you know of, and you want to figure out what this value is likely to be, right, what, what would your typical strategy be to figure out what, like, let's say this is 1 and this is 100, and, you know, you're this far along the line, how would you guess that value? Yeah, you do what's called linear interpolation, where you pick the least, the best fit line between those two points that you know, and then grab the value on the line at the point you're interested in. And you could adjust this, right? You could actually say, well, I'm going to split this up into multiple points I know of and interpolate between them. And, you know, that would account for something like this, where, you know, maybe there's a point in the middle here that doesn't quite line up with the other ones, right? So you can make it a little fancier. But what don't you know have, what don't you have a measure of at all when you make an interpolation, whether it's piecemeal, like you know, you interpolate this line and then this line and then this line. I mean, there are a lot of things you don't know, but one of them might be how confident are you in this interpolation, right? And so the other way of doing this is actually to make a prediction, spatial prediction or forecasting sometimes people call it, or unfortunately people will make these, uh, make these words synonymous when they're not. So the difference between interpolation and prediction is with interpolation you're fitting a, a deterministic function to your data and trying to find, to determine an intermediate value, some kind of a deterministic function for the most part. Whether it's spline or IDW or something even fancier, you are you're saying this is the value here given the data sets around it, and there's no indication of how confident you might be in that determination. The difference, so so this is you know it's largely deterministic. The color of the wall is white, off white. I'm not saying I think it's off white, but you could call it cream, right? I'm saying the walls are white in this freaking building, and that is my de declarative statement, right? Prediction, though, is usually, in the GIS context, a stochastic process. What does that mean? Yeah, it's based on probability. Okay, so when you make a prediction, you are not determining a value, you're predicting a value and assigning a, a level of confidence or probability to it. Right? In fact, you're assigning a probability that that value is, is not correct due to random chance, because you can control that. Right? In other words, if I say that the walls are white, I'm saying I'm 95% sure that the walls are white. That means that I, I'm only allowing a 5% chance that I randomly picked the word white and got it right. Okay. Uh, or you might say, if you're flipping a coin, what's the probability it's going to be heads if the, kick, the coin is fair? Julia, flipping a coin, heads or tails, what's the, what's the probability that the, the head's going to flip and be a coin? If the coin's a fair coin. Can one half it's probably yeah, one half, fifty percent, right? Fifty percent chance going to be heads, and you know there you might make a prediction, right? Uh, it's going to be heads, 
but what's the what's the level of chance that you're going to get that head right just kind of random? Well, 50 50 percent of the time, it's going to be right. So when you make a, a, a prediction, a spatial prediction, you're making a, a forecast or a prediction of value, and then you're assigning a, a probability to that value, which would indicate how often you're going to get that same value by random chance. And the way that you do this in GIS, in, in ArcGIS anyway, is through a process called creeping, A-R-I-G-I-N-G, creeping. Are you with me? There's a very subtle difference between interpolation and prediction. But you can think of interpolation being, I'm, I'm looking at the data and its characteristics and I'm saying this is, the value at this point in my landscape is 17 parts per million. How'd you get to 17 parts per million? Well, you relied on an algorithm, right? So it's nice, it's recoverable, but it's also deterministic. It's not 17, but I'm 85% sure it's 17. It's 17, got it, right? But, but what does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, you're not allowing for the chance that it's an outlier, you're not allowing for the chance that it could be just, you know, you sampled incorrectly. It's not statistically speaking, at least in terms of um, trying to make predictions or inferences, it is not uh, generally accepted to take completely deterministic inputs. So if you start getting into, I want to model a distribution of things based on deterministic data, uh, often people say, well, you know, that's, that's not, not the best idea because you're taking essentially almost you know, the binary outcomes and comparing them to one another. That's not how the real world works, right? How many shades of gray are there in every problem that you solve, that you solve in your daily life? I, I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you kind of, this is what I'm trying to say. Prediction, in uh, spatial prediction involves some component of randomness. And that is crucial when it comes to advanced geostatistics, where you're looking at making inferences based on a data set, making predictions based on a data set. You need to know what the probability that each one of those observations or predictions is going it, it is going to be true, not because of random chance, essentially. Right? Like uh, if you make a forecast and you say, "Well, I think it's going to rain tomorrow. I'm 30 percent sure of it." Right? What does that mean? Because you're not very confident in your prediction. That's the difference. Interpolation: you are laying down the law and not and saying nothing about how certain you are. So if I walk up to Griffin and I say, it's going to rain tomorrow, what would you say? Do you know what the forecast is for tomorrow? Yeah, so if I was like, Griffin, it's going to rain tomorrow, you, you probably say, no, it's not, right? It's not supposed to. But another response would be like, well, how sure are you of you that, right? And then I'd say, oh, I don't know, I'm 15% sure, because I haven't looked at the forecast, right? Uh, that's the difference. Uh, with interpolate or uh, prediction, rather, you are providing some measure of, of confidence or um, some some measure of how likely that prediction is to be true. But are both of them are finding a point you want based on other data? You have? Correct. Okay. So the the input data are going to be the same, and the purpose is very similar. But when you run spatial creeping, the difference is that you know creeping versus say IDW creeping is going to give you the capability to get probabilities associated with the predicted value, which is crucial for certain types of statistical analysis. All right, I'll stop beating that dead horse, and let's actually get into how you use the tool. So the first, there are actually two ways you can do this. And uh, this is the, the heart of the assignment for this week. Uh, so the first one would be uh, if you run, if you search for uh, Krieging, K-R-I-G-I-N-G, there is the Krieging tool here. Uh, I'd run the spatial analyst one just because I know that that's turned on on all of my machines. 
And, uh, you know, it's just a simple, it's a relatively simple tool where you put in your point field, or your point features, in this case, your, the, your sample points, and you pick a Z value. This Z value is just going to be the, uh, the, um, the lead value. Why is it Z? Well, Kriging, like many spatial interpolation and prediction techniques, assumes that you have an X and a Y, which is your geographic location, and the Z is going to be the value that you're trying to interpolate. Because right? you're really making a surface here, like a digital elevation model. Right? That's what you're doing. You're taking point data and turning it into a surface. You want to pick your output location. In my case, I'm going to uh, drop it out here. I'm going to call it standard krieg.img. I'm going to put a .img on the end, so I create an Airdas Imagine image file, which is easier to delete later on than a uh, arc map. Yeah, so, so if you save it as something that's not a .ing file, if you don't put anything there, it's going to save it as a raster grid, which has a folder and a couple files, and no matter what you do, you're never going to make that folder go away. Right? It's always going to be there unless you delete it in. Uh, you could use a tip. You put .tif on the end. You could put .jp2 on the end. There are all kinds of file formats you could use. I'd recommend .ing or tip. They're going to work for that at least for our purposes. So I'm going to put .img on the end. And uh, then, of course, like all these tools, you've got some decisions to make. And you should make decisions in an informed way. So you can ex expand this help on the side. And over here, we have some just some very brief descriptions. Or you can go into the full help. But Krieging relies on something called a semi-variogram. Now, a semi-variogram is sort of like what we made the other day when we were running all those, um, what were they? We were running all those uh, Moran's eye calculations at distances. Remember that? Making that graph and looking for the dips. Sort of like that. A semi-variogram semi is... graph where along here we have distance. So this would be a little short distance, this would be higher distance. Okay? That's pretty self-explanatory. But we're graphing out <laughs> this is less uh, self-explanatory. Something called pairwise Semi-variance. So what's variance? The statistics. What's standard deviation? In statistics. So if I say the the average grade in the class is a B minus, or a, let's say a seventy-eight percent with a standard deviation of 12, what does that tell you? Yeah, so what that's saying is if we have a distribution of data that's a normal distribution, the mean is 78, and the standard deviation is, uh, what did I say, 12, right? That means that Basically, within one standard deviation above and below the mean, we have something like 63% of the class is within 12 points of 78 points. Right, it tells you basically how spread out the grades are. If, this, if the value of standard deviation is big, then you have a lot of variation in your data set. If it's small, you have very little variation in your data set. The semi-variogram graphs out the variance between two paired data points, okay, so they just take two points at random, essentially, that are close to one another, and calculate the variance and value between those two points. Variance is just the square, or the, yeah, the, um, the square of standard deviation, okay? And so it's just a bigger number that gives you a little bit more detail about the level of variances there. 
So it calculates the variance between two data points, okay, and graphs that according to, it, to distance. Now, knowing about spatial autocorrelation, the idea that close things are more related to things that are than related to things that are close, right? So close things are more related than things that are further away. What would you expect to see as distance increased? Would the, the difference between paired data points get bigger or smaller? It would get bigger if there's positive spatial autocorrelation. In other words, when things are close together, they're going to have very, very low uh, semi-variance, right? Um, but as you go out, things are going to get more, they're going to diverge more. So that, that variance between those two numbers, that spread between those two numbers is big. Okay? Does that make sense? In other words, you're, you're comparing two numbers. And when, they're, when those two numbers are observed close to one another, chances are they're going to have very little difference or small difference. But as you get further and further away, that distance can get bigger and bigger. And so your that distance, or that, that difference, gets bigger with distance. That would be one way of looking at it. If you have negative spatial autocorrelation, meaning further things are more related than closer things, okay, which doesn't happen very often, you know, the semi-variogram is going to look something like that, right? Where the further you get away, the closer the data values are to one another. Not physically closer, but data space, not numerically closer, right? That's what a semi-variogram is in a nutshell. So you have to think about, well, what process am I looking at? Lead values. What would you expect to see with lead values? Would you expect to see them similar close together or different close together? Probably pretty similar, right? Because lead's coming from somewhere. And it's probably coming from a, a set of points. <laughs> so we would choose, a, we have to choose a, a Krieging method. We'll just go with ordinary in this case and actually in the case of the assignment. But you have to choose a semi-variogram model. And in this case, it might be a good idea to open up the tool help and look at what these look like. Okay, because they have little graphs in here of each of these. Uh, if we look at... Learn more about how Krieging works. So, <clears throat> scroll down here. They have various choices here. We have spherical, circular, exponential, Gaussian, and linear. If we look at the help, they actually graph these out for us. Here is spherical. So it comes up, the, the uh, line comes up, and it sills out. It goes flat. Circular. Uh, there's a very subtle difference between the circular semi-variogram and the spherical one, right? They both level out, but the circular one looks like it levels out a little higher uh, and a little less gradually. Definitely a little less gradually. Exponential, right? It takes quite a while for it to sill out. Basically doesn't. Gaussian has uh, areas of high growth and or high correlation and lower correlation as, as uh, distance goes up or linear. So what do you think about lead? You know where lead comes from? Paint, fossil fuel use, and gas additive, primarily. Probably in, in that, in rank order. So what do you think? How would distance relate to semi-variance? What kind of relationship would you expect? And this is literally how you make this choice in, in ordinary creek. It's going to be what? It's probably going to be spherical. Yeah, uh, it's going to be something like spherical or circular. It's going to level out at some distance, probably. Where either you're so far away it just kind of stabilizes, or you've got so many different effects at work kind of a baseline lead exposure. But, you know, you, if you can make a, an intellectual justification for one of these, then, you know, that's, you pick that one, right? But you have to make a justification. 
I'm not asking you for it in this class, but uh, for this lead stuff, I mean, I would suggest that probably circular uh, might be a good choice, right? Because as distance, that semi-variance is going to increase until you hit a certain distance and then it doesn't really matter anymore, right? You're comparing apples to oranges, and so your semi-variance is going to be so big it doesn't matter, right? So anyway, maybe we go with circular. So uh, you pick circular. Then you have to pick an output cell size for your assignment, and for this one, pick 30. Okay, 30 meters in this case. And then you have to choose whether you want to pick your number of neighbors or your maximum distance. Let's go with number of neighbors being, uh, be, or the search radius being variable based on 12 points as your neighbor. Just go with the default. And then we can hit OK. Krieging is a relatively processor intensive exercise. And as you can see, you've got to come up with some, some parameters here. And you've got to think about it. Like, how does semivariance work with my data set, with my phenomena of interest? And, and think about it this way. Let's say you were doing this and wanted to present the results at a conference. What would you have to do at the conference? You'd have to justify your at a minimum, you have to justify your selection of a semi-variable, right? Because I could be like, Jake, why'd you pick circular and not spherical? Right? Why didn't you pick Gaussian? But the people, they use like empirical data sometimes to, to justify those, or it's not all just, we think it works like this, so we uh, at this stage, there's, I have not seen that much empirical basis for ordinary creaking, uh, semi very gram selection. It's getting better, but for a long time, until very recently, there wasn't much discussion of semi very gram selection empirically. But, in a minute we're going to get to a tool. Yeah, trying to make something that's Yeah. So what do we notice with this output? Here's our whole data set. It looks like we've got some uh, <laughs> some highly focused areas of incredible lead, some other areas where lead might be concerning, and then the rest of the place lead's pretty low. Right. Well, we could change the we could change the um, the mapping strategy here, symbology. Um, make it into a stretch display maybe and we'd see a little bit more variation in our data set so in this case purples and reds and oranges are worse than yellows and a couple th what jumps out at you anything just looking at this map David what do you notice about this huh Oh, it's, it's still working? Well, you can look at the one on the screen. What do you notice about this? What, what seems to jump out at you? So remember, blues and purples and reds and oranges are higher. Higher lead concentrations. Yeah, basically all along 3rd Street. Huh? Say it louder. Yeah, basically the urban core of Terre Haute especially the oldest parts of it, have high, high, high lead, right? Interesting. But what else? Does this look like a realistic display of lead concentration? Yeah, it's kind of blotchy. Uh, I mean, yes, the high lead concentrations here, you will find high lead concentrations almost universally, right? But Yeah, it, it seems to be artificially like high zone, and then you walk across the border and you're like, ah, I don't have to worry about lead exposure anymore. <laughs> we know that's not true. Uh, I'd worry about lead exposure everywhere in this country, frankly. Uh, and definitely anywhere where ho houses are older than built in 1973, because um, they almost certainly have lead paint in them. So, <coughs> uh, so anyway, 
So there are problems. Now, you could tweak the settings, pick a different semi-variogram, pick a different number of neighbors, pick a different search radius. But all of these changes to parameters, you have to justify. And this is where Jake's question, well, has anybody tried to empirically you know, justify this stuff? And the answer is, initially, not really. Then some people are like, well, yeah, I mean, OK, I'm going to run this test. Or I'm going to do this. What's another way to verify something if you don't have observed data? Well, you can do something called a Monte Carlo analysis, right? Where if this is a random process, you let the random process run out over a thousand times or ten thousand times, and you see the trends in that resulting data, and use that to justify your selection. And so, we actually have another tool here called empirical Bayesian Krieging. Now, you might be tempted to run empirical Bayesian Krieging through this tool. But that's not a good idea. Instead, you should turn on the Geostatistical Analyst Toolbar. That opens this up. And then you, <coughs> excuse me, you select the Geostatistical Wizard. I just think about the Cards Against Humanity card that talks about wizards. Um, then we can go ahead and pick our geostatistical method of empirical Bayesian increasing. This is actually accessing the exact same tool that shows up in that toolbox on the side, except this one's the interactive version of the tool, which is a little bit more explanatory. So you click on empirical Bayesian Krieging, and then we would pick our sample data points, and we would, rather than proportion minority, we want to interpolate lead, the PB final, or not interpolate, predict final lead values. And it's going to say, hey, uh, I'm looking at these locations. It looks like you have two observations at the same point. So you've got to pick a, a conflict resolution solution. In this case, because we're worried about the health, maybe the human health impacts of lead, not the lead mining uh, potential for Terre Haute, uh, we would select maybe use maximum rather than use mean, right? Just because you want to mitigate for your maximum lead exposure rather than your low one. Hit OK. And it, it runs in the background the model, the prediction, over and over and over and over again using a variety of different um, simulations, a variety of different parameters, and, and outputs what it believes is a best fit solution. Okay? This is empirical in the sense that it's like a Monte Carlo analysis. And you don't have to run it a thousand times to get an idea of what's going on. It runs it in the background. It might take a little while on, uh, on many computers. Huh? Uh, how many iterations? Number of simulations, 100. Right? Okay, so, so it's nice because you can look at this and we can actually start messing with the parameters a little bit interactively. Like maybe we want to localize lead, say our, our maximum number of neighbors is eight and maybe our minimum number of neighbors is two, right? And, and it'll, you can see it changes the likely output of your prediction process. We can output our surface type, we can say probability here. And it'll give us the, uh, the probability of a, a certain amount. Um, we can up the number of simulations to get a, maybe more certainty about what things are going to look like. Probably putting it at 1,000 is not a good move until you're certain of, or relatively certain of what you want to see. And, and what this does is it removes the need for you to justify some kind of selection of a uh, semivariogram because it's basing it on the semivariogram cal uh, calculator from your data set, right? That's what this graph here is. Um, it tells you where the, um, where the, the uh, nugget is. What's a nugget? Uh, 
excuse me. Huh? Yeah, it, so the nugget actually uh, refers to a portion of the graph of the semivariogram. So if your semivariogram goes like this, where's the nugget? It's, it's like this, this whole area here between, basically it's the, the slopiest part of the curve. You have a sill here, which is where it levels out, right? Uh, the slope, power, etc. But anyway, this is a good way to avoid having to justify empirically your choice of your semivariogram model because you're calculating it based off of your data set. Um, so let's go ahead and run this. I'm going to run this with uh, um, we'll say 12 neighbors, 12 and 12, so that it matches the other parameters that we had for the, the standard Krieg. Should have dropped the number of simulations back to 100 just to make it run faster. And it'll actually it, it'll <coughs> predict where your data are going to sit. Um, you can even look at your standard errors. Right? You don't want too many standard errors far from the this blue line, which is a predict line of prediction. And uh, yeah, it'll even give you a here's the measured value. Here's what it would be predicted if you didn't have the value there by the Krieg and it gives you a, a measurement. This is the other part of spatial prediction that you don't get from, uh, from interpolation. It tells you how far off your interpol interpolated or predicted values are from real values if you wanted to. So we can run this. It's going to run a, a little report for us and the output will look a lot different. I mean not a world different, but much different than the output from before. So if I mi match the symbology uh, to the same one as before, what do we notice between the two? So this is the empirical Bayesian Krieging, and this is the uh, standard or, uh, ordinary Krieging. It's a little bit more gradation. And overall, lead concentration values are higher, right? Okay. Now, unfortunately, I have grad counsel today because, you know, this week has to be ridiculous. Um, but I don't want to leave you without showing you what you need to produce for the, for, the, for the assignment, which you could actually produce, if you've been following along, right now, and then save to a flash drive to upload when I finally get the upload thing up there, probably after grad counsel at 4.30. And what you would do is you take, um, let me see here, uh, you open up something called raster calculator, not calculatory, but calculator. Uh, raster calculator is a nice way to, um, to interact with uh, raster layers. And then the other thing we need to do is export our the output of our empirical Bayesian Krieging to a raster. And you want the cell size to match the cell size of the other, the one that we did before, which is 30 meters in this case. And I'm going to save this as ebk.img. ebk is empirical Bayesian Krieging. And I'll hit OK. It's going to run. While that runs. Thirty three zero, yeah. Then I just want to make sure I'm telling you the right thing here, so we'll look at the new version of this. Running. 
go. EBK minus. So uh, you would, after you've saved the output of your empir empirical Bayesian Krieging, you would run raster calculator, which is going to take that output. You're going to basically write an expression here. You double click the layer standard Krieg, which is my previous one, the, the Krieging from the, the one that's just called Krieging. And I actually want to set this up so it would be my ebk.img file, which isn't complete yet, minus standard Krieg. And I would output that to a file name, maybe my last name, right? Or something that would differentiate it from other files in your folder as a .img or .tiff file. Then you're going to upload that IMG or TIFF file, probably in a zip file, to Blackboard as your answer. You'll want to save this in a place where you can find it. So going with the default, not a good idea, right? You would go here, output raster, you know, uh, maybe I'll call it aldrich.img, and I'm saving it to my folder on this computer. I would show you, but it's still executing the empirical Bayesian Krieg. What we're doing is subtracting the standard Krieg from the empirical Bayesian Krieg, right? So the two methods of doing Krieg to find out where the hot, where the big differences are and the little differences are. So think about it. EBK minus standard Krieg, the <coughs> minus standard Krieg value is going to, uh, if it was lower in the standard Krieg, you're going to have a positive value in the output. If it was higher in the standard Krieg, you were going to have a no way. So lower here, data, yeah, you're going to have positive values. If higher, you're going to have a negative value. And you can see where the higher and lower places are between these two things. You can see the differences visually very quickly. And it gives you an idea of where maybe the, the normal pre without the, all this empirical Bayesian repetition is overestimating or underestimating. Assuming EBK is a better version, right? Or at least you can see. Really, for me, it's a, it's a quick visual way for me to see that you've done the two pairs of things. So it's not going to be like, oh, Jaleel's had a standard deviation in the difference of 12, and Cole's had one of 17, and Cole's of course. It's going to be more like, okay, there's a pattern, right? Is the, are there you know, positive and negative differences generally? So Wednesday, we're going to look at spatial autocorrelation, which is measuring whether places are grouped or not, whether it's positive or negative spatial autocorrelation. Um, and yeah, uh, at 3.30 today in room 138, uh, Scott Ishman is giving a presentation. He's a candidate for the chairperson of the department. You should go if you can. I would be there if I could, um, but graduate council meets and I'm need to be there today. So uh, I would also recommend EES students um, that you keep an eye out for the future chair candidates and any other events. Um, it's good to get to know these folks because they'll be running an apartment in a few short months, right? Okay. You'll get the upload place, uh, upload thing for this uh, output image will be available by this evening. You can try to do it while I'm in grad council, add it in there, but we'll see. Depends on how things go. Uh, and you should, this is of course due by next Wednesday at 5 p.m., meaning that I'll be here on Monday to help you if you've got any questions. Okay? So Wednesday, look online for uh, spatial autocorrelation. Yeah. Um, 